Maria. Nicholas. Nicholas, are you still over here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so confusing with so many chairs on stage. So, here we are. Yeah. As, the, as it was discussed, since, 11, since 2011, raised about a billion dollars. I think you've doubled in headcount to 2,500 in the last year. The valuation topping 3 billion. That's a pretty good run for a company that's, what, four years old. When you started this back in 2011, let's start off with a simple question. Did you expect it to go so quickly? Um, I would probably lie if I said yes. I don't know. It probably over exceeded all expectations, even, even mine. Yeah. Um, we, we did believe very hard in the business and, and when we started, but of course, you didn't expect 34 markets, 3 billion business. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and and when, it, when you look at the 34 markets, uh, we're, we're sitting here in, in Helsinki. The whole idea is, you know, from Europe, you've got to go global quite quickly. What were some of the, the challenges you, you faced when you went from, you know, starting out maybe some European markets and now you're in obviously 34 uh, countries, you know, spanning the globe? But what is the, the maybe couple of big challenges you faced doing that? Oh, I think there are so many challenges to go through. I, I, I couldn't even say one. It's, it's just a massive headache that you expand so many markets, find so many good people, having a product that you can roll out, deal with scalability issues. It's, I think the, the challenge is just dealing with so many things at the same time. And for that, you need always really, really good people. Um, and that's easier said than done. Uh, you will do good hires, you will do less good mm. hires. Um, I, I, I think that's the biggest challenge, making sure that you, you handle growth. And when we were talking backstage, you, we were discussing how you obviously, you know, you, your company's based in uh, Berlin, Germany's a, a big part of your market, but you're also in a bunch of Latin American countries over in Asia Pacific. Can you walk me through some of the challenges you maybe face in emerging markets that you, know, you hadn't expected when you first expanded there? I know one challenge you, you enter in many on the emerging markets is that they don't have the same infrastructure that we do. So if you look at Saudi, for example, we, we, we have to build the whole logistics and we have to build the whole mapping systems. Uh, same with India, same with a few other markets. We actually have to invent the mapping system and address systems. Um, you have to deal with a lot of failure rate. You have to deal with the, um, restaurants not acting the same way you would have acted in, in some of the other markets. Mm. So I think those are some of the challenges. Uh, dealing with different cultures is always different, sure. uh, regardless. Mm. Um, yeah. But I presume you have the, the cultural challenge even in, in Europe, right? You know, no, no oh, yeah. country is ever the same. <laughs> but when it comes to, for example, sort of the whole the restaurant component to this, you, you mentioned in emerging markets, maybe they don't act as you may think they would have acted. Can you give me a couple examples of, of what you mean by that? So, I don't know, if you speak on the restaurant side, it's, it's, uh, you would expect that it would take care of the customer. So, uh, in a couple of markets, we, we built more the, the backbone. We sent them orders and hoped that it would do a good job delivering it to the customer. But we, we realized that the service level was so bad. Uh, customer got their food in one and a half hours. It was not good. Restaurant didn't care. They declined it and so on. So just educating the restaurant how important it is to give the good service. Mm. Um, that was one challenge. And that's why we also partially built up our own delivery fleet and build algorithms to make sure that you can actually find the best food in your market. Um, that was some. I think dealing with, with also with different cultures in your, your staff is, is a challenge. Mm. Um, the way you have to give direction is different in, in Sweden or Finland versus in Mexico. Um, it's, well, it's in Mexico, you're doing more forthright. Yeah, you, have to, you, you can give a bit more freedom probably in, <laughs> okay. in, in, in Finland. You just and go and do this yeah. uh, while you have to be a bit more directive. Mm. In, in some markets. When you look at the, the valuation and the money you've raised, part of that has been through, has led to all, both organic growth but also acquisitions. Any acquisition, be it a, you know, a small one or a multi-billion dollar one, is tough, right? You have to bring in those people, you have to deal with those, those challenges. Walk me through exactly how you've gone about that, because obviously Turkey most recently, how have you gone about, A, bringing that into, the, you know, enveloping that into in what you do and then, then using that as a, as a basis for future growth? So I think when we have done acquisition, we have been very careful in what kind of acquisitions we do and also making sure that we have a team that we actually rely on. We don't want to buy just assets and, and uh, just get scale. And we want to make sure that we actually build and buy a team mm. uh, to run it. 
So when we do, did those acquisitions, we often involved the, the team very heavily in the management team and agreed with them and got them to back it, making sure that they have the incentive and keep the equity in, in the business. Uh, doing so, you make sure that you actually can use and leverage the entrepreneurship that, that changes everything. Um, at the same time, you can apply a, a couple of learnings and how you do certain things more systematic. Mm. Uh, and I think the combination of that entrepreneurship and that global best practice has been super, uh, uh, been very successful for us. Yeah, I also presume as you've done more acquisitions, it's become maybe not easier, but you have at least a, a blueprint on how to do it. Yeah, we have done a lot of mistakes uh, on the way, but yeah. uh, been lucky that it still worked out. Mm. Um, but yes, you learn over time. Now, part of the offering now is logistics. I think everyone wants to sort of offer that logistics component. Before we get into some of the competitors and how you're dealing with those, can you walk me through exactly the importance of that logistic arm and maybe explain exactly what that is to, to the audience? So, uh, the, the, know, the importance for us when we, we get someone on our platform to order food is that we're making sure that he gets good food delivered fast. Um, in order to do so, in order to have good food, we need to have restaurants you not necessarily do delivery, then we have to help them to do the logistics. Or they do logistics, but they're not good enough. So it takes an hour to get the food, and we won't have it delivered in 30 minutes. Um, and that's why we have to build this logistics to make sure that we can deliver good food fast. Mm. Um, and, and, and that's a key part of our, our strategy, to make sure that we deliver that. And that is having drivers on the ground. It's having sort of the back office or the sort of the to make sure everything works on, you know, the way it should. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's not easy. Yeah. Um, so we're working with thousands and thousands of drivers. And if you look globally, the, the amount of logistics that we do via restaurant is, is, is uh, I don't know, millions and millions of, of, of deliveries. Now, you look at some of your competitors, uh, many of which uh, you know, are in the public market now, and they can have access to the, that, that capital. But it's not just the Grubhubs and just each of this world. You look at Amazon, you look at Uber. There is a push into on-demand food and another. So you guys obviously, you've got some cash behind you, but you're obviously not public yet. So uh, if that may or may not happen, how are you dealing with the challenge of going up against some of these big boys who, frankly, have more cash than you? Yeah, I think as long as we make sure that we give a great service, uh, like we do, for example, here in Finland with Fedora, or that we build with delivery here in other markets, as long as we're making sure that we really build a good product, I don't see why someone would go to Amazon or someone would go to Uber. Um, but, it, but it puts a challenge that we really have to build a good product, uh, that we can actually get food in 30 minutes and that we can actually have a good meal. So um, um, I, I think as long as we do that, then we also have enough money. It's not going to be a money game, it's going to be a product game. Um, but how could it not be a money game if you've raised so much money that, you know, that we, we, you know, you look at the Uber valuation, there's obviously a transport component, but they are now moving into other part of logistics. Right. It seems a bit of a land grab is going on right now. No, absolutely. But I think we all position our, ourselves in, in a point where we don't need money. And we, we, we transmit, our, 30 million meals per month. Mm. Um, and so we already have the size and the scale. Now it's just about the product. I think if you had asked me two years ago, I would have said like, I would be scared because mm. we need to raise the money necessary to build that scale. Now I think we have the scale and we just have to really nail the, 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 all of the last bits. You've been on the record um, previously by saying that you're not going to go for an IPO this year. Um, with what we've seen recently with HelloFresh and Deezer, I presume you're quite well, glad that maybe you're, you're going to postpone that decision until 2016 and, and beyond. Yeah, for, for us has always been the focus of building a really good business. And if that is a public company or a private company, it doesn't really matter as long as we build a good business. And the decision that we took earlier this year that we're not going to go IPO uh, this year and, and probably not beginning of next year either, is just for the reason that it's too much distraction and we, we, we can get the capital elsewhere. Uh, so I think right now I'm quite happy that we're a private company. We can make the decisions and investments necessary to build that product. Um, so yeah, I'm quite happy that we have stick to that decision. And do you have enough money? Are you, are you looking to raise any more cash if you want to expand even further? 
No, we have, we have enough money, uh, but, but we, we have very ambitious plans, uh, so you never know if we're going to raise more. <laughs> I suppose you're always in the fundraising mode to, to some degree. Um, when it comes to other components, we, we talked about some of the logistic area, you're talking about maybe moving into sort of the high-end premium restaurants. When you look at future growth, are you going to stick to food? Are you going to maybe move into other components? Are you using logistics can go across multiple industries? No, we want to we want to focus on uh, on the food side. So so we don't want to distract. It's it's about making sure that we build the best service there, um, and that means someone wants to have something delivered fast uh, and eat consume fast. So it's not about the next day delivery. It's not about other deliveries. Uh, mm. We we want to make food. Uh, when you're hungry, we should be the place to go. Mm. When you look at the growth of companies like yourself, and you've gone from, you doubled to 2,500 people in the, in the last year, part of it is about culture, right? And, and you can't hire everyone, and you can't know everyone because it's frankly too big. How do you maintain that sort of corporate culture when frankly you're no longer a startup, you're a pretty big tech company? Oh, that's, that's one of the toughest questions a, a company like ours will have. Uh, I think what made us successful is that we have we have been very good at, at giving autonomy to teams. So we have built the business very much from the ground, uh, mm -hmm. meaning we're giving them the authority to take decisions. Um, and, we have, we have, um, and I think that's the culture, the entrepreneurial spirit, and so on we have been able to maintain. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I think it's something that we've always worked on and took care of. So when we're done acquisition, we're really making sure that we're doing the right acquisition that has a good culture fit. Um, when it, the principles of the people that we want to hire. We always set very early. We want to have hard, like, passionate people, entrepreneur spirit um, when, when we hire. So I think. And how do you do that with 2,500 people? Not everyone has the, can have the entrepreneurial spirit yeah. of, of, say, you, right? Uh, it's, it's, super, it's very challenging. I, 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 I have no idea how we managed to get there. We were probably lucky. Mm. Um, I, 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 I probably try to live after my own values as well, mm. and, and people will probably look after and, and, and follow that. So stay true to your own culture and, and set the culture such that it fits you, mm. <laughs> because otherwise it's not going to be a, a true culture. Mm. You have a, a number of blue, blue chip investors, one of which is, is Rocket Internet. Now, you know, like it or not, there's sort of a love and hate relationship with, with Rocket and, and what they do. I mean, what is it like having Oli and, and, and his, his guys and girls uh, as, as investors in Delivery Hero? I think it's really good. I don't know, they, they have a lot of expertise in many areas. I think we do things very differently from, from Rocket, uh, but I think it complements uh, very well. Um, we, we, we can gain a tremendous amount of value and, and, and expertise that they have across 100 different portfolio companies, uh, as central teams that we can pull in when we need. At the same time, we, we are a delivery company. We want to build a delivery company. We're successful being a delivery company. Um, for that reason, we, we keep and maintain the company while we still leverage the part that we like yeah. of Rocket. And I think that's been uh, very, very positive. Mm. I was on stage earlier this morning talking to Nicholas Enstrom, and one of his points was about not going beyond the 1 billion valuation stage and trying to get to 10. And the idea being that you get European companies to not only build, but also to do M&A and, and sort of have those you know, tens of billion valuation that maybe we see in the US and, and in Asia. And you're obviously not there yet, but you're definitely on the M&A side, you are growing. We have a variety of entrepreneurs in the audience. I mean, what is the advice you would give someone you know, who's just starting out who sees an opportunity in the market and, and wants to go after it? I think in general, you shouldn't be focused on your valuation uh, too much. It's, sure. it's, uh, it, and also not so much about investors investing. You should be focused on building a really good business. And investors will see that you're doing so. So don't adjust your business too much based on what the outside would think, but, but what do you think? I also think that, I don't know, don't sell too early. If you have something that works, I don't know, try to figure out what that is and try to scale that as, as much as you can. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I, but I wouldn't be too focused on valuation because I think you, you, you build the wrong kind of business. Sure. I mean, when it comes to, uh, in the past, European entrepreneurs have, to a degree, been criticized for maybe setting out too early, as you, as you mentioned. There's obviously not everything is, is about the valuation, but when it comes to growing a business here in Europe, you know there are some limitations purely because of the, the, the geography that we have. How have you guys gone about that? Uh, being based in Berlin, having 34 countries, I mean, one would suggest that you are a pan-global company. 
that is by no means an easy task. So a couple of examples, you know, thoughts on how anyone in the audience could, could do that. Maybe not 34 countries, but go beyond their own national, even European borders. I, I, I think, I don't know, as a European company, and especially like a Finnish company, you kind of have to. Yeah. <laughs> You're forced to go internationally. And that's, that's, of course, a big challenge. And I think one shouldn't. It has a lot of challenges, but it's also not impossible. Um, so it, it just, I don't know, just do it. I don't know, just figure out how you do it and, uh, and uh, get good people on board who can actually manage it. Or maybe someone has done it in the past, or I've been experienced from a company that's done it in the past. And um, I, you should obviously make sure what you do before you do it, mm. um, meaning you should really figure out your own business model. And don't scale before you really figure that out and before you have the capital necessary, because you might burn yourself. And then it's very hard to scale out. And if, yeah. it's, if you fail on scaling out in the first time, you will not get a second time. Yeah. So make sure that you really understand what you do and what really drives that. And, and from that, I think it's very easy to try to replicate it in, in, in several markets. But really figure out what you do before you start taking on a lot of cost. Can you give us a couple of examples, or even one example, of where something's gone wrong for you uh, and a lesson you've taken from that? I presume since 2011, not everything has been rosy. So you've obviously had to pick yourself up a couple of times. You know, any lessons you can take from that? Um, I think, yeah, no, it, it, there are many cases when you feel like that was, that was not smart. I think um, the, the, the easiest. I think focus is often underestimated. And probably people speak about focus, but they don't really live by it. Um, I, I think that is something for an entrepreneur is very hard, because you see so many opportunities, you see so many options, you see so many things you can improve, and you want to do everything. But and getting that focus and really figure out what are we really good at and make that really, really well. Um, and I think that is a couple of times we realize, like, wow, we, we are just beyond our capa capabilities now. Yeah. Um, we are, we're too widespread, and, um, um, and that's, that's probably one learning. Um, there, there are many, many other learnings. Having said that, I think everyone would have to learn their own learnings. You have to go through it. You, you have to feel the you pain. You can read a book, and you can hear everything what I say, and you will say, yeah, you will still do a mistake, and that's fine. Um, as long as you, you, you start kind of building into your, uh, your, you your own knowledge up. base. Exactly. Yeah, and pick yourself up. Great. I think the other one is that you don't, not, not making changes fast enough. I don't know if you see something is not working. I don't know, figure out what you have to do. Or if you see that uh, the, the, you made a wrong hire, someone who doesn't fit to the team. I don't, know, don't wait. Um, you, 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 have, you have to act fast on those things. Um, it, Great. Well, I think we've run out of time. Nicholas, thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs>